This is the Verbatim Word Podcast, where we seek biblical truth in a daily context. I'm Justin Gary. We spend much of our life as bystanders, those who just happen to be at a certain place at a certain time. We watch as life goes by all around us in this crazy, odd, and sometimes mad world. Being a bystander means you are not the center of attention, but you catch a glimpse of life and events taking place around you, or even get swept into things that you had not planned to be a part of. Sometimes bystanders become heroes, as was the case a week or so ago in San Diego when a man witnessed a woman crash into a fire hydrant, sending her car rolling multiple times, the woman becoming trapped. It was just after three in the morning, but luckily an anonymous bystander heard it happen and rushed to the scene to help pull the woman out of the vehicle before emergency crews arrived. Bystanders often becoming the first first responders and saving the day. We sometimes hear the term innocent bystanders, meaning people were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Last July 4th, a gunman took aim at the streets filled with passing floats and lawn chairs and strollers of spectators coming to watch the Independence Day parade. When he opened fire, kids in the marching parade scattered, instruments in hand. Bystanders grabbed their kids and fled to stampede to safety. In the end, seven innocent bystanders would die a whole spectrum of lives between the ages of 8 to 85. We find ourselves thankful in some situations for bystanders, like the stranger who stops what they're doing when they find a child crying suddenly lost from their parent. Personally, if it weren't for a good Samaritan bystanders like that, I could still be sitting crying in the stationary aisle at a Kmart in San Diego some 40 plus years later, separated from my mom and figuring I'd never be found again. Thankful for those bystanders. Bystanders can be key witnesses, not intending to view something that later needs to be verified, called upon to give statements, or more and more in our on-demand world, capturing key moments on their cell phones that they pulled out at just the right time. The bystanders being a critical part of piecing things together to get the story straight. Sometimes being a bystander is just amusing, where you see things or hear things by chance you may not have otherwise been an audience to. Walmart comes to mind in this category, where you see and hear all manner of things from all manner of personalities from all walks of life. It's a social experiment sometimes and can be pretty entertaining as a bystander. Aaron and I have a ranking system of some of our area Walmarts, and we know some will surely provide entertainment with eccentric people and kooky situations as we brave our way down the aisles and through the parking lots. Just innocent bystanders trying to pick up some essentials but there are just some things you can't unsee. Maybe you yourself have been blessed with bystanders who happened to be there at a time when you needed it, helping you with car trouble or a flat, providing a license plate number, lending you their cell phone, or just making you smile with their SpongeBob pajama pants and bed slippers at three in the afternoon as they brush by you in Walmart as they head for a gallon of milk while having what should be a private conversation on their cell phone that is on speaker mode. And it's likely that you have been just a bystander, just going about your day or attending an event and suddenly you're involved in something bigger than you anticipated. Life happening all around us and your path intersects and you are brought into the story in the right place at the right time. As we get to the most critical part of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is headed to the cross, heading from his illegal trial to the brutality of Calvary. And in this section of the Gospel of Mark, we see an assortment of bystanders along the route. Groups, individuals, all sorts of backgrounds and a variety of roles, but all drawn into the story of Jesus paying for the sins of the world. And when it comes to Jesus, none of us can be mere bystanders, can we? He requires a response from each of us, and it is one that is of utmost importance. So we join the crowd of bystanders in Mark chapter 15, starting out in verse 16. Though Jesus was completely innocent of all charges, we ended last time seeing that Pilate wanted to please the crowd. He released a guilty prisoner named Barabbas to the crowd and had Jesus scourged before delivering him to be crucified. Now, Mark almost passed over that in verse 15, putting it this way, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. It's almost a side note, isn't it? Almost like he brushes over it. So he was scourged and then they took him to be crucified. Well, I do not think that Mark is making light of this, but he wrote for a Gentile audience, the Romans, so they would know exactly what this all meant and entailed. 
but almost like we grab the remote at times and fast forward through parts we don't want to watch or watch again. Mark does that with the scourging and crucifying because this was brutal. The scourging when they took the strips of leather, braided with bone and metal embedded, lashes across the bare back and torso, tearing into the flesh, pain unbearable, bleeding unstoppable, cutting into the muscles underneath and even the organs sometimes. And there were professionals who did this. It was their job to scourge them right, make sure to make it the most excruciating possible. The Jews would give 40 lashes minus one to show mercy. And in the case they can miscount in the case that they miscounted along the way, but the Romans must have watched Cobra Kai and their motto was no mercy. Then Pilate delivers Jesus to be crucified, something that must take place to fulfill God's plan for redeeming mankind. It has been prophesied centuries before. Psalm 22 is what is called a messianic psalm. And much of what we see in this crucifixion scene was recorded in that psalm long before, a prophetic glimpse at the Messiah's death. And verse 16 of that psalm said, They pierced my hands and my feet, a clear nod to death by crucifixion. But ironically, Rome did not start crucifying as a means of execution until about the 3rd century B.C., The cruel death probably started with the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and the Persians used it wisely by the 6th century B.C., Alexander the Great adopted it and started using it in Eastern Mediterranean countries in the 4th century BC, and Rome got it from the Phoenicians in the 3rd century BC. But Psalm 22 was written prior to the Jews being taken captive to Babylon in 587 BC, and the psalmist wrote about the Messiah's hand and feet pierced. How accurate is that? It's like if you knew someone who died in a car accident and someone hundreds of years ago had written down that the person would die by means of a device that used fire to propel itself at very high speeds while riding on four hoops of black rubber, all before there were even cars invented. They wrote it. Someone basically predicting how the death would occur. So Jesus is led to be crucified, something that would fulfill the Father's plan of redemption. And we see a stop along the way to the crucifixion site where we catch our first group of bystanders. Verses 16 through 20. It says, Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. This group of Roman soldiers has been sent to guard Jerusalem. And this would not be your ideal military station as a Roman guard. The Jews did things their own way, and they were resistant to Roman oversight. They were, after all, the people of God, called to be a theocracy, to be governed by God. And there was resentment and resistance toward Rome, their taxes, their presence even. The Romans, for example, idolized Caesar and would say, Caesar is Lord. The Jews would not comply, not recognizing Caesar's authority over them. And it was all heightened at the feasts, when the crowds of Jews in Jerusalem would surge and messianic fervor would heighten as the Jews longed for a Messiah to deliver them in this Passover season when they remembered the Lord had set them free from bondage once before, the bondage of Egypt. So the soldiers bring Jesus to the Praetorium, the military fortress where they were stationed, and this whole garrison gets together, and they make mockery of Jesus, this, quote, King of the Jews. Romans recognized only one king, a great, powerful, authoritative Caesar. In fact, they had started Caesar worship in about 44 BC with the death of Julius Caesar and the Caesar being declared divine. So they hear the charge that Jesus is the king of the Jews. And they see this as amusing, as an amusing diversion from all the tensions of guarding this Jewish city. Lots of built up tension, resentment, even racism against the Jews. And they take it all out on Jesus. A few instigators, most likely, but a whole garrison of bystanders watched the mockery. They put a purple robe on him and a crown of thorns. Royalty in those days would wear purple and a laurel crown, so the soldiers improvise. Some surmise that since the Roman soldiers wore scarlet, they may have found an old scarlet tunic or robe that had faded, maybe cast off like an old rag, and yet it still had enough color to appear purplish. And the crown of thorns pressed into the skull, piercing the skin, causing him to bleed even more. Maybe placing a reed in his hand as a pretend scepter, then taking it back and hitting him with it. 
the bowing, the spitting, the worshiping, the mocking. You can imagine the hall echoing with laughter and shouts of the soldiers, all riled up in a frenzy, making a game and diversion of this moment. It was hazing at its worst, bullying at its finest, ganging up on an innocent man. This sort of thing ends up on the news nowadays when word leaks to the media of a military group doing things inappropriate, or a police unit abusing their power, or a fraternity getting violent in what was once meant to be fun, or a sports team roughing up too much in the locker room. But none of these bystanders cries out for them to stop. None step forward to call these soldiers to account, and Jesus, the King of Kings, is humiliated in this setting. Some of these soldiers will come to believe once they witness the cross and the resurrection. Some of these soldiers will guard the tomb and run in fear as it is opened or when they see it empty. Some of these soldiers will lie to cover up that the body is gone. But in this scene, none of these soldiers spoke up to say, this is not right. God is God, and he can defend himself. And there are times in this world where God is mocked, blasphemed, disrespected, and in many situations, God is silent. He does not send down the lightning bolts like in the cartoons, turning the offender into a crispy critter in an instant. But as the people of God, there are times that we must speak up. We're not just to stand by in the crowd and do nothing to defend Jesus, as was the case with the abuses of the garrison. If there were any soldiers there who were sympathizers of Jesus, or perhaps even believers, they said nothing. They did not speak up. And we can be tempted to do the same as God's people in a world that is hostile to him, doubting of him, contrary to him, rejecting of him, oftentimes in self-protection, self-preservation. But though it may be challenging to do so, though it may be intimidating to do so, though it may be easier not to, there are times when we must speak up for Jesus and for the things of God. I spoke with two mothers recently who realized that they need to speak up to become a voice for what is right, to express what God would have them say and do. For one mother living in a state where schools require the HPV va vaccine for students in certain grades to attend, the virus can't spread through common contact that might occur in high school hallways or classrooms. And as a believing family, they disagree with the school's rule to require it. And they've been able to get around it for a while, but now the school is saying that since the child has received other vaccines in life, that this family cannot seek a religious exemption for this one specific vaccine that is for an STD, that they can't pick and choose which vaccines would be a religious exemption. Frustrating for sure. And this mom said that they can't just go along with it. And if the Lord needs to make them an example, then they may have to be, but they cannot just stay silent. Another parent is not in agreement with some curriculum content at their child's school. She feels like there there does not add anything to the curriculum. There's an agenda behind it. And the content goes against things that they believe in and is willing to remove their child if needed. And this mother realizes the need to speak up, to say something, to be the voice that does not just go along with things, but voices an objection and says, we are not okay with this. Now, there are many things as Christians that we can and should speak up about. So many issues in life where we do not see eye to eye with the world and with society. And there are times when we will be called to speak out from a biblical perspective on the issues. But speaking up for Jesus himself is something that we must do. Like when the apostles were told not to speak the name of Jesus, they could not comply in the book of Acts. In the Praetorium that night, not one of these soldiers spoke up for Jesus. But within the coming hours, and some in the coming days too, they would become believers in Jesus Christ, and they would not be able to remain silent any longer. The scene moves on from there as they head to the crucifixion site in verse 21. It says, Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. This man was coming out of the country. We spoke about that on the last podcast. Many were there for the feast, but they stayed outside of Jerusalem in the surrounding countryside, coming in after the start of the day. Could be one reason that the crowds early that morning before Pilate yelled, crucify him, because most of the Jews there that morning would have been local, and that the visiting ones, like those from Galilee, would not have yet been in the area. Simon is likely there for the feast. He is a Cyrene from northern Africa, today Libya and they compel him to bear the cross. In those times, if a Roman soldier rested their sword on your shoulder, you were required to do what was asked. And this guy is compelled to carry the cross beam of Jesus' cross because he was weak and couldn't bear it on his own. Just a bystander in the crowd, 
Wondering why the road is blocked at the intersection he came upon, and the Roman soldiers spot Simon and compel him to carry the cross. What an impact this had on Simon. This Passover that he made the journey to Jerusalem, his life would never be the same. He would never celebrate the Passover the same way again. This one would change him. We're told he is the father of Alexander and Rufus. The early church that, write, that Mark writes to knows them. They're believers, most, most likely that many readers would know of them, perhaps prominent roles in the early church. Paul writes that this is at the close of the letter to the Romans, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. It's believed by many that this is the Rufus whose dad bore the cross of Jesus on the way to the crucifixion site, and that he and even his mom, Simon's wife, became believers. Can you imagine Simon telling the story that day when he reunited with his family if they were not alongside him? Of the man whose cross he was compelled to bear? A bystander in the crowd at the wrong place at the wrong time or perhaps the right place at the right time. And you wonder if he stayed at the cross once he brought it there and watched the scene that unfolded and all that took place. The mockery, the exchanges on the cross, the darkness, the earthquakes, and the saying of a cross on the Christ, uh, the Christ on the cross. Did Simon become a believer that day? And in sharing with his family, did they choose to follow Jesus as well? The Bible calls us to bring Jesus into our homes. Husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Wives are even told that their godly conduct might win over an unbelieving husband. We're told that Timothy had genuine faith, something that first dwelt in his mother and grandmother, and now he shared it as well. We saw this in our first ministry in Slovenia, as many of those who came to faith were the first ones in their families. And the church was full of mostly young people, and no one in their family shared their faith. And they longed and prayed for opportunities to share the gospel with them and see their families come to Jesus. I remember holidays were a big thing at the church because many of the non-believing family members, like parents and guardians, grandparents, would be, would be open to coming to church, where we might have a special program or service for Easter and Christmas. In fact, I remember Easter. Easter morning is a big service in America. Even non-churchgoers will go to church on Easter morning, where culturally, though, we ran into something there. Easter breakfast was a huge thing for families, even non-believing families. And if we had service that morning, none of their families would come, and they wanted their families to hear the gospel. And even some of our church members would not be able to come because it would be so disappointing to the rest of their families and so uh, inappropriate not to show up to Easter morning bre breakfast with the family. So we switched it up. Not every, not very American, but we had Easter service on Sunday evening, pretty much the only Sunday service in the evening the whole year. And my American cultural Christianity struggled with that at first, because in the U.S., we do sunrise services, Easter Sunday morning messages, but we moved it to Easter night. And I finally felt a bit better when I looked at Scripture and saw that Jesus appeared to his disciples on Resurrection Sunday in the evening behind closed doors. That is when he appeared to them after the day. So we did it in the evening. And we always had family members come. And we would make sure the gospel was super clear because the church full of young people wanted to share Jesus with their families, to find a way to bring Jesus into their homes. So that was always a desire. The home is the first place that we should seek to bring Jesus and what he has done for us. And Simon the Cyrene likely did that this day. And Mark mentions it became a family of faith. The prison keeper in Philippi thought he was done for. There was an earthquake and the prison doors had opened and the chains of all the prisoners were loose there in Acts chapter 16, and he thought the prisoners had surely fled. But when he checked, Paul and Silas and all the other prisoners were still there. And we read this in Acts 16. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Sil Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. There was this domino effect. The prison guard was open to the gospel. And through what the Lord was doing in his life, it opened the doors to his home, and he believed in God with all his household. It wasn't a group price or anything. The house didn't get marked off because the prison guard believed, but they all came to believe individually, responding to the same message, the gospel. 
God often works in families when someone in that family brings him home. It could be the one family member who gets saved and they start praying. The rest of the family comes to Jesus. But Jesus also enters our homes when we purpose to let him work through us. To be the one who says, hey, let's pray about it. Or the one who chooses not to respond in the flesh, but to walk in the spirit. Or the one who makes a suggestion to change some old habit or ways of doing things and help change the way the family does things in the way that might honor God more. Changing the dynamic of a family can feel overwhelming and like you are up against impossible odds. But if you are committed to bringing Jesus into that home, he will be with you. He will guide you, give grace to you, give an extra measure of his Holy Spirit to you, and in the end, he shows up. And it's not your creative planning or cunning plotting or convincing words. It's Jesus' impact upon you that then spreads to the others. Simon the Cyrene brought Jesus home that day. The story of what he witnessed, of what this man did. And literally, the blood of Jesus was upon this man. As he carried the crossbeam and the blood from Jesus' scourging was, not on, was now on Simon, he was covered in the blood of Jesus, and he would never be the same. Ray Boltz recorded a great song back in the 80s called Watch the Lamb, an artistic rendition of Simon's experience and his two boys, Alexander and Rufus. Worth a listen if you've never heard it or if it's been a while. Watch the Lamb. It's a good classic. Here in the Gospel, Simon did not set out to do this. He was just an innocent bystander. And the Lord's plan interrupted Simon, and he went with it. Oh, the blessings that come when we allow ourselves to be interrupted. It's not always planned. Simon likely had an agenda for the holiday. It's not always convenient. Simon, touching the blood, may have been defiled ceremonially, not able to participate in this Passover celebration that he had come all that way from Africa to be a part of. But God had a plan. And Simon went with it. How blessed we would be if we would be open to God's interruptions. If we would even set out each day with our eyes and ears open to look for where Jesus shows up and join him. The Bible study and workbook, Experiencing God by Blackaby and King. I've done it numerous times and something always sticks out with me. It says, find out where God is working and join him. We are to position ourselves where God is and align ourselves with his will, his work, his agenda. For example, if someone brings up God in a conversation, God is working there. And we are to readjust what we are doing and press into that because that is something that God is doing. How dynamic of a life of faith we would live each day if we were willing and available to be interrupted to receive the invitations Jesus gives us daily to get involved in his work. And this can be so hard in our on-demand world. And we can see them as interruptions and inconveniences. But if we can step into them as much as possible and realign our lives to what the Lord is doing, it is amazing to be a part of something greater. I'm stoked to be finally heading back to Europe this summer. It's been four years since we've been back. COVID kept altering and delaying plans. And especially excited since the church we planted will be celebrating its 20th anniversary since we registered it with the Slovenian government. Kind of a big milestone in the life of that ministry. Hard to believe it's been 20 years. I remember my first summer missions trip to Europe. That was 29 years ago at the time of this recording. We had a plan. We had an agenda, an itinerary more or less of what we're going to be doing. Our team from Hawaii set out thinking we knew what we would be doing, and we got there, and some of that stuff happened. But the things that seemed most fruitful that summer were all the things that we had not planned. And when the interruptions came, we just chose to say, okay, Lord. And then we pressed into those and they were blessed. We started joking that we had a quote, God plan because our plans kept getting derailed. In fact, there was not a plan during that trip to even go to Slovenia because some other plans got altered and canceled. We had a hole in our agenda and we said, okay, Lord, we'll go to Slovenia because an invitation had popped up. And the rest they say, well, it's history, not just for the church that started there eventually, but even for my own life, my own calling. But all the amazing things we got to be a part of, they were not on the agenda. They were doors that opened as we were already there, opportunities that came up without our scheduling and planning. They were seeming interruptions, redirections, invitations, circumstances, and we went with them, and they bore fruit. Simon did not set out that day to carry the cross of Christ. He did not step into Jerusalem with a plan to get saved that day. But this procession, it was an interruption a divine interruption, and Simon went with it and came to know Jesus and be forever changed, and his family as well. They arrive now on the scene, a familiar scene, 
and there are many bystanders looking on. Some are friends and some are foes. Verses 22 through 32 says, And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, The King of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right hand and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled which says, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said, He saved others himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. It's a mixed crowd of people all of these bystanders. And though we are told that Jesus is crucified, saving mankind at this very moment in the scene right here, we get most of the focus on what all these bystanders are doing about it. Notice all the bystanders. The Roman soldiers casting lots for his garments, the sign placed above Jesus' head. The two robbers fulfilling prophecy, one on the right and the other on his left, were told that even they reviled him. Those just passing by, throwing in their two cents, provoking Jesus to come down. And then there's the religious leaders, mocking, irreverent, poisoned with envy and delighting in his suffering. Jesus, most holy Jesus, is fulfilling his purpose in saving mankind. But for these bystanders, it seems to be all about them, doesn't it? I mean, even reading Mark's text, they are all responding to what is happening to Jesus, but it's almost like we're spending more time seeing the crowd's response to Jesus in these verses, more than a focus of what Jesus is doing for them. Here, at the ultimate expression of God's love for mankind, what Jesus is doing is close to being ignored. Sure, it's the reason that they're all there on that hill, but their views, their opinions, their actions, their commentary, it seems to take the focus, to take over in the scene stealing the focus from the work Jesus is doing on the cross. How true this is. We tend to make it all about ourselves, don't we? To take center stage. Look at everything through our own lens. Even when Jesus should be center stage, we upstage him. At church, it should be about Jesus, but it becomes about us sometimes. Did the worship leader entertain us well enough today? Were the songs to our liking? Did they pump us up the way that we wanted? Did the sermon make us laugh enough? Did it itch our ears? Was the service too long? Were the people behind us too distracting? Were the cool kids in church there to make us feel good about ourselves after? Or was it all the people that we don't very know very well and we feel awkward having to talk to for a few minutes so as not to appear rude? Jesus should always be center stage, but we have been fed the lie that it is all about us. Many make the observation that even the worship songs that we sing, so many of them filled with the words I and me and my, singing out to God with ourselves as the focus, the point of reference, rather than making it all about Him. And though it's considered an old song by now, the words of this worship song are so true. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. In the Old Testament worship, worship became about the people. It was self-centered, self-seeking worship, and the Lord was not having it. He said through the prophet Amos to the nation of Israel, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fat and peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. The Lord said that he hated it. He despised their worship. There was no savor. He called their songs just noise. He wouldn't listen to the music. When worship is off, when we lose focus of what it is, when we carry on and it loses what it is supposed to be, we just become bystanders, not really entering into true communion with God. Something deep and true should take place in worship. It's not a Christian sing-along or a concert we get to attend. Jesus said this in the Gospel of John, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers, worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It can be easy to just be a bystander in worship. 
to go through the motions, to have our hearts and minds elsewhere, or to make it all about us, what we want from God, what God can give to us. But when we make it all about Him, we can truly enter in. That is what it means to worship in spirit and in truth. Our hearts commune with Him, and our souls are filled up with more of Him. There is a mixed group of bystanders here in this scene in Mark 15. At the foot of the cross, the Roman soldiers were self-seeking, gambling in front of Jesus as to who would get his garments, the only earthly possessions this preacher from Galilee had, and their attitude, what am I going to get out of this? What personal gain will I get from something that is my duty to do? How many get near Jesus only when there's something in it for them, a self-seeking worship, to gain something personally from him? There at the cross also, the two robbers. We read that even they reviled Jesus, their own bitterness at their situation consuming them. Jesus, an easy target to bully him, with his sign, the King of the Jews, above his head, taking some of the focus off of their crimes of robbery. So easy for them to point fingers and Jesus to make themselves look a bit better. Hard to do when you're exposed like that on a cross. But they are pulling at straws. How many times do we minimize the reality of our own need for mercy, trying to make ourselves look better compared to those around us, rather than just owning up to who we really are and how desperately we need Jesus? One of these men, thankfully, would have a change of heart and be with Jesus in paradise that day. But how much time wasted on trying to make himself look better rather than just owning up to the truth of the situation? There near the cross as well, those passing by bystanders throwing in their two cents, provoking Jesus to come down. It says, those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, aha, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. They all had an opinion and felt the need to be heard. It's the epitome of the armchair quarterback, criticizing what others are not doing. It's the soapbox people get on with social media, safe behind their six-inch screen to say whatever they feel like at the moment without knowing the whole situation. These bystanders found a way to get in on the action rather than just walk on by. This was part of what the Romans intended, crucifying on the main roads so that the criminals would be an example and deterrent to others from doing the same crimes, a sort of get your act together or else this could happen to you too. But there is no conviction in these people passing by. They delight in publicly shaming Jesus. They have all the advice and recommendation for what Jesus should do in this situation. And how many times we have opinions for others in their situations. If they would just take our advice, they would not be in their bind or kick it out of it. We could be quick to chime in, to give our opinion, to suggest to others what to do in their situation. And there are times when the Lord would give us the wisdom to help another, encourage another, exhort another, as the body of Christ bearing their burdens a bit in a way that points them to Jesus and gets them moving forward from where they are. But many times, we don't know the whole picture. And the Lord's not necessarily calling us to say something or get involved, but we do anyway. And the advice that we give is just our own take on the situation. But we have not sought the Lord and His will and His direction, really hearing from Him in a way that might help those people in need. Their advice there at the cross, save yourself and come down from the cross. This is full of their wisdom, but it's foolish since Jesus is saving them. And if he comes down, they cannot be saved. How often we try to give our advice, not just to others, but to God as well, thinking that we are all wise. And if God would just do things the way that we suggest in our lives or the lives of those around us or the world today, we should, we should get things fixed in a hurry. But thankfully, God does not listen to our advice because he is up to bigger things than we might ever realize. Another group of bystanders there at the foot of the cross, the religious leaders, mocking, irreverent, poisoned with envy and delighting in his suffering. They say, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. This group of bystanders is skeptical. With all the miracles that they've seen, with all the lives that they've changed, with all the work of God, with all the wisdom from heaven that Jesus has given, these skeptics taunt Jesus to come down. They say that we may see and believe. They had already seen so much and did not believe. Their skepticism can't see the truth of what Jesus is doing. All of the Old Testament pointing to the substitutionary sacrifices, the very holiday they are observing pointing to one lamb that would cover them and cause the curse of death to pass over. They still say that if they will see this one last thing, that they would believe. 
If Jesus would come down now, they would see that and believe. These bystanders have hardened hearts. Some will see him and come down from the cross, died and wrapped in a shroud. But Jesus would do it on his terms. And when they see him again, resurrected, alive from the grave, within some time, many of them may believe. We read in Acts 6, after Jesus' resurrection, and early on in their church, we see, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. We read that in Acts, the word of God spread, the gospel, fulfilled with the death, burial, and resurrection. It spread, and the number of disciples grew, and many of the priests became obedient to the faith as well. But it was on Jesus' terms, not theirs. If he had come down that day, they likely would not have believed. But because he did not come down and fulfilled all that God had for him, some of them later on, well, they did believe. Here, this group of religious bystanders thinks that they can prescribe what they need to see to believe Jesus. But Jesus knows better what they will need to see and believe. The world is full of people still today who think that they can give God a list of things that he can do to prove to them that they should believe. But the Lord knows us better than we know ourselves. And he might hold out for something more powerful if needed. Or he may ignore our demands and say, I've already given enough evidence. You have just chosen not to see nor to believe. That's something Jesus had challenged this same group of religious leaders with years earlier in John chapter 9. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. These religious leaders thought that they had the perception of the things of God but they were actually blind. And though bystanders of the cross, most would see nothing, at least for now. In life, none of us is just a bystander. We all have to take action at some point. Encountering Jesus demands a response. And we can't just stand by passively on the sidelines and not get involved. For the unbeliever, you cannot be just a bystander to the gospel and be indecisive. Making no decision is already making a decision. For it is appointed for man to die once and after this the judgment. So if your life were to end this day unexpectedly, suddenly, what would be your fate? If you have just been living as a bystander, watching Jesus from a distance, your your fate is not secure. Jesus told a parable of those who did not make a decision to attend the feast, and then tried to be more than bystanders when the time came. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite them to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Though none of those in attendance deserved to be there, those who accepted the invitation, leaving their place as bystanders outside, they were given garments to attend. Since they received the invitation and were not prepared, they accepted the righteous robes that were offered to them. But the one that was kicked out, he came in and tried to remain a bystander. Not accepting the robe that was offered, not committed to truly attend, maybe not planning to stay the whole evening, not fully accepting the invitation, just munching at the buffet line without really planning to stay. A bystander, a wedding crasher. There are no bystanders in God's kingdom. This man was cast out. For those of us who do, who do know the Lord, it's time to get off the sidelines. Like Simon, we will be called into the service of the Lord. Not always on our timeline or when it's convenient, but if and when we step in, there comes unmatchable blessing. We will be called on to speak up for the Lord. We will be enlisted to journey with the Lord, to carry what is valuable in the Lord's ministry that is fulfilling. We will be drawn off of the sidelines to be more than bystanders, having witnessed too much as bystanders to not respond, becoming those who worship Him in spirit and in truth, the Father seeking such to worship Him. The altar call is not a requirement to respond, but the altar call can be a great first step of faith to move from being a bystander to a participant. What is the Lord prompting you to do in response? Where is the Lord challenging you to move toward Him? How will you go from being a bystander to joining the Lord right where He is working? There is no better place to be. So Holy Spirit, 
have your way in us. We yield to your leading, trusting that you are a good and perfect God, a loving and gracious Father, a faithful and holy Savior who takes away our sin and gives us new life, who covers us in robes of righteousness if we will just accept them, and that you call us into what will only ultimately fulfill your call upon our lives, further conforming us into your image and growing our faith so that we can walk more in step with your purposes and your callings. Lord, catch us up into whatever it is that you are doing. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.